Hi, everybody. Today we're going to provide a global overview of the epidemiology of alcohol use disorders. And one of the things about epidemiology is that it does provide us with a big picture assessment of what's going on in a descriptive sense. And the first thing to realize about alcohol is that it is a legitimate commodity. It's a commodity that's traded in the marketplace and there's competition and that affects price and availability. So we need to take into account that alcohol is a commodity. Uh, alcoholic beverages are economically embedded and they're uh, linked with a large production and distribution system where they become commercially available. Alcoholic beverages provide profits for farmers and manufacturers and advertisers. Uh, they, plied, they make uh, employment for many people in bars and restaurants. They provide tax revenues to governments. And at the same time, we have an alternative market where alcohol is sometimes produced off of the commercial market and distributed in developing societies where it is sometimes called unrecorded consumption, which means we don't actually know how much alcohol is being produced and consumed. Here's a rough estimate of the distribution of alcohol consumption around the world, both in terms of what we know about commercially available alcohol that is consumed and unrecorded consumption, which is estimated and incorporated into these per capita consumption estimates. The estimates are made in terms of liters of alcohol, uh, of pure alcohol that are consumed by uh, segments uh, uh, of the population in these different countries. And the maroon and black parts of this uh, global map depict countries that are relatively high, way above average, in their average per capita alcohol consumption. And what you see here is across Europe in particular, very high consumption, which extends into Central Europe, the former Soviet states, and Eastern Europe, and then across the Soviet, the former Soviet Union itself, now called the Russian Federation. Uh, the next level down is also high consuming countries, such as Australia, Canada, and uh, some countries in Southern Africa. And uh, close behind them are countries like the United States, most of the Latin American countries, and uh, a few African countries. The countries that stand out as being relatively low in per capita consumption are uh, North Africa and the Middle East, for obvious reasons, because the uh, Islamic religion forbids alcohol consumption, and many of the poorer countries, the less resource countries in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. But you can see there are remarkable differences around the world in per capita alcohol consumption, which suggests uh, perhaps an insight we may want to pay attention to in this course. We're going to be considering different risk factors, including genetics. But this type of variability around the world uh, needs to be understood in terms of environmental issues, not genetics. Another way of looking at the epidemiology of alcohol use as an ordinary commodity is the changes that take place in consumption, particularly per capita consumption, over time. This graphic uh, traces the changes in per capita consumption over a 40-year uh, period for four countries, Brazil, France, Russia, and Thailand. The top part of the graphic shows what happened to alcohol consumption in France from the 1960s and 70s up until the turn of the century, 
uh, 17 years ago. And what you see is a sharp decline in average consumption in a country that had the highest per capita alcohol consumption in the world. So France is a wine producing country where uh, in, uh, up until the 1950s, people consumed uh, on average 27 liters of, of wine per person. And that declined to almost half of that amount over a period of 40 years. What accounts for it? Well, we're going to be talking about that in this course. But environmental circumstances, changes in work habits, the shift from a rural environment to an urban environment, and particularly changes in lifestyle. People stopped drinking cheap wine as their income levels increased, and they needed to be more responsible coming to a, a job in an urban environment rather than uh, drinking uh, uh, outside when they're working in the agricultural sector. The next line down shows the changes in alcohol consumption in the former Soviet Union when it transitioned into uh, the Russian Federation after the fall of communism. The then president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, instituted some dramatic changes in the production and availability of, of alcohol based on the tremendous uh, harm that heavy drinking had done to Russian society, particularly in terms of life expectancy. And with that dramatic decline in consumption over a period of several years, you had uh, significant changes in the health of the population. But as you can see, just like uh, prohibition de uh, reduced alcohol consumption initially in the United States in the 1920s, you got a gradual recovery of consumption as black market production increased. And finally, the uh, forces against this particular reform became so powerful that they retracted the uh, limits on availability and alcohol then again flooded the market. And by the, 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 the late part of the uh, uh, 20th century, you have uh, a recovery of alcohol consumption. So here again, you see dramatic changes in alcohol consumption for different reasons than we saw in France, but nevertheless very important because these changes in consumptions, as we'll be talking about, have direct implications for changes in problems. The final two graphs for Brazil and for Thailand show developing countries and what's happening with modernization. And with modernization, we're getting increases in per capita alcohol consumption, which in some cases are approaching the developed countries. So all of these things indicate that uh, there are dramatic changes over time and we can monitor these changes in consumption as well as problems through a variety of different measures that we'll talk about in this course. Getting back to uh, alcohol as a commodity, paradoxically, paradoxically, alcohol is also uh, not an ordinary commodity. And the reason that it's not considered to be an or, uh, ordinary commodity is because of the tremendous harm that is uh, associated with alcohol consumption. And they far outweigh the benefits as we will talk about in this course. Epidemiology has provided a powerful tool for us to understand how alcohol can be considered no ordinary commodity. And what our epidemiological research reveals is that there are three important mechanisms that explain the harms caused by alcohol. And you need to become aware of this because they account from, for all of the different types of problems that alcohol is associated with. So let's get into those mechanisms. First of all, the mechanisms themselves, which are alcohol's toxic effects, its uh, effects on intoxication level, and the production of alcohol dependence. These depend on exposure. And there are two types of exposure. 
One is exposure through the average volume of alcohol consumed, and at a population level, we just talked about per capita alcohol consumption. It's just the amount of alcohol that people pump into their system day in and day out. That leads to uh, alcohol dependence. It leads to toxic effects. It leads to chronic uh, 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 health problems as well as social problems. Another factor that uh, affects how alcohol exacts its harm is through uh, the pattern of drinking. So the toxic effects of alcohol are derived mostly, but not entirely, from the uh, average amount of alcohol that people ingest, ingest on a daily basis. And that accounts for chronic diseases. And finally, intoxication itself, uh, as we know, accounts for accidents and injuries when people become physically impaired. Uh, there are big variations among adults and among young people, and certainly across countries, as suggested by the earlier uh, longitudinal trends that we were tracing. Uh, big variations in how much people drink in a particular society and how often they drink to intoxication. So in this graphic that shows both adult drinking and adolescent drinking, we get tremendous variations among uh, selected countries. Uh, countries like Finland and Russia and the UK have high frequency of, uh, of uh, intoxication in both youth and, and adults. Countries uh, like the former wine-producing countries have high average consumption but lower rates of, uh, of intoxication. So countries need to be looked at in terms of historical trends, in terms of the drinking patterns, and in terms of the average volume of alcohol consumed. Alcohol dependence itself, which is the third mechanism we talked about, is a syndrome, a clinical psychiatric syndrome that operates on a behavioral level in terms of uh, impairment in a person's ability to control their drinking. It operates at a cognitive level in terms of what people think about most of the time, how they organize their lives, whether they experience craving, and it operates at a physiological level, in particular the development of tolerance and the development of uh, uh, physical dependence, which leads to an alcohol abstinence syndrome or withdrawal. So an alcohol dependence syndrome is a quantum change in somebody's ability to function in society. And that's an important ingredient, but not the only one, in our discussions of alcohol epidemiology. To summarize what we know about alcohol epidemiology, there are striking gender differences between men and women in terms of how much people drink, and that is observed in almost all societies. But there again, the population trends uh, over time in the more developed countries, which have more equitable policies towards gender differences, uh, those trends show a, um, a convergence of consumption between men and women and a convergence of problems. Among drinkers, men often drink more heavily than men, but in uh, countries where there is uh, gender equality, that is disappearing. Abstinence and infrequent drinking are more prevalent in older age groups and in uh, less developed countries, the low and middle income countries, uh, more abstinence among women and uh, certainly in countries that have social uh, uh, and religious injunctions against the consumption of alcohol. Uh, most of the alcohol consumed in a society is consumed by a small minority, which means that we can focus on that group of heavy drinkers if we're looking for targeted types of prevention measures. And epidemiology is very helpful in identifying who those people are. Uh, a generalization that we've learned from the study 
of the epidemiology of alcohol problems is that the more that average alcohol consumption increases in a society, uh, the more that uh, we have uh, heavy drinkers. It doesn't get distributed equally among all people. The more people who are drinking, the more people are likely to be recruited into the ranks of heavy drinkers. And with that, we have uh, more problems uh, in a society. So when per capita consumption increases, there's an increase in the prevalence of alcohol dependence and alcohol-related problems. Here's another finding from epidemiology that's very useful for alcohol policy at a national level or at a local level. If we can keep availability down, if we can keep consumption down, we can prevent problems. Uh, another thing we've learned from epidemiology is that people influence each other's drinking. So people operate in social groups. Heavy drinkers tend to uh, drink together. And uh, the social networks that people have can have an important influence on whether they drink more or whether they drink less. Another generalization is the pattern of drinking makes a big difference. Drinking to intoxication is linked to suicide and injuries, heart disease and social harm. And uh, light and moderate drinkers in many countries consume on average as much as heavy drinkers, if only because there are many more light and moderate drinkers as there are heavy drinkers, which means even moderate drinkers are sometimes at risk for alcohol-related problems. And that's it for today on the global epidemiology of alcohol.